Hello, everyone. We're going to get started. My name is Shakela Alvarenga. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Mob Museum. Thank you to those of you joining us in person and to those of you joining us online as well. So, welcome. She was once described by the U.S. Coast Guard as one of the most remarkable women to ever work in the U.S. government. Cryptanalyst Elizabeth Friedman decoded more than 12,000 shortwave radio transmissions sent by rum runners during Prohibition, and her team's work resulted in 650 criminal prosecutions. Here to talk more about Friedman's vital role in Prohibition enforcement is Claire White, the Educational Programs Manager at the museum. Please welcome Claire. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm so excited to talk about Elizabeth Smith Friedman today. Um, and I'm so excited to have the opportunity because I think that she just represents so many, so many interesting elements of the Prohibition era. Elizabeth Friedman was Rum Runner's worst nightmare. Um, as Shakela mentioned, she decoded more than 12,000 shortwave radio messages sent by rum runners during Prohibition, and she was a vital part of Prohibition enforcement. Her, te her team's work was the uh, culmination of 650 criminal prosecutions against rum runners, and today she's recognized by many in the fields of intelligence, counterintelligence, and cryptology as one of the most influential people in the field. In the past, her legacy has sometimes been overshadowed by her husband, William Friedman, who was also a very important cryptologist. And in addition, the covert nature of her work in many ways led to a little bit of a forgotten legacy for many decades. But renewed interest in this legacy began in the 20 teens, and in 2017, there were two seminal biographies that came out about her The Woman Who Smashed Codes by Jason Fagan, and A Life in Code, pioneer cryptanalyst Elizabeth Smith Friedman by G. Stuart Smith. Tonight, we are going to explore the research that those books compiled, as well as additional research that I've done into her life um, in the collections of the George Marshall Foundation and others. So let's get started. Elizabeth was born to Quaker parents in Huntington, Indiana in 1892, and she was the youngest of nine children. They weren't a particularly education-driven family. She was one of only two who attended college. She went to the University of Worcester and then transferred to Hillsdale College in Michigan. Uh, she left because her mother had been ill, and when she returned, she decided to transition to a different environment. There, she studied multiple languages and received a degree in English in 1915. And like so many liberal arts majors over the last century, she took that degree and went and got a job in education. Uh, she thought, you know, I'll, I'll go teach. Um, and she then wound up becoming the substitute principal of a public high school in Indiana. But again, like so many graduates of the liberal arts world, after a year, she said, oh, this isn't for me. I wasn't meant to teach. And she moved back in with her parents. And so after um, a few months of that, she decided to go to Chicago and look for work. She really wasn't sure what she wanted to do. Uh, she knew she loved language. She knew she loved literature. And she hit the pavement. She didn't find anything. And after a fruitless week of looking for work in the city, she decided to take a field trip to the Newberry Library. And there, she asked the librarians to see Shakespeare's first folio, which is still one of the Newberry's best known collection pieces. As she stood there looking at the first folio, one of the young librarians came over and started asking her about her interest. And they realized they had a lot in common. They were both Quakers. Uh, they would both sort of had this liberal arts background. And Elizabeth explained that she was looking for work. And this young librarian said, well, are you interested in Shakespeare? Is this a great interest of yours? And, and Friedman said, oh, yes, it most certainly is. Um, and so the librarian offered to call a man named Colonel George Fabian. 
and he was the wealthy owner at the time of the Riverbank Laboratories, which was the nation's first private research facility. It was located in Geneva, Illinois, on a 500-acre estate. And he came down, he, he came down to the library that afternoon, met with her, and after a very brief conversation, he said, I'm taking you to Riverbank, you're getting on a train with me, whatever you have, bring it. So she got onto the train with this strange, and truly, I don't mean strange as an unknown, I mean a very strange man. And as they were traveling to Geneva, he gets into her face, this, you know, 20-something young woman, and he says, well, Elizabeth, what in the hell do you know? And she very calmly says, that remains, sir, for you to find out. After her whirlwind tour of Riverbank, she began working for Fabian on what was called the Baconian Cipher Project. And I'll talk a little bit more about that specifically in a moment. But it's worth mentioning what this project, uh, what its goals were. So her boss at Riverbank was a woman named Elizabeth Wells Gallup, and Gallup believed that uh, Shakespeare was not, in fact, a real person, that all of the Shakespeare works were written by Sir Francis Bacon. The sort of Bacon uh, theory is, a, is one that has existed even as early as when Shakespeare was still alive. So this wasn't a particularly uncommon theory over the years, but it's been incredibly difficult to prove. This project meant to prove that, in fact, Sir Francis Bacon had authored Shakespeare's works and that the way that you could tell this was using a cipher, that there were these decipherable messages in Shakespeare's works. And so at Riverbank, Elizabeth Smith worked on this, and at the same time, she met a man named William Friedman. And William Friedman was a, the head of the genetics department there at Riverbank, but he also was a photographer in his free time. And so he worked with Gallup and with Elizabeth Smith taking photographs of the Shakespeare works that they were trying to decipher. When they first met, uh, Elizabeth wrote in her diary and in her correspondence that she was really not drawn to him uh, for personality or looks. She just liked that he was the next youngest person at Riverbank. She thought that that was, was their uh, primary driving factor in becoming friends. But clearly it, it became much more than that because just a year later, just over a year later in 1917, um, they married. So Riverbank Laboratory was not just their place of employment, it was also their home for many years. Uh, it provided this idyllic setting for a number of different uh, research projects. And both William and later Elizabeth lived in the windmill that you can see in this slide. <laughs> and it was also William's primary laboratory facility. Elizabeth became intimately familiar with ciphers through her work on the Baconian cipher. So she had no previous cryptological experience. As I've mentioned, she was an English major, she liked foreign language, she'd always been drawn to puzzles, but certainly didn't think that that was going to be a career path for her. But she learned about Bacon's cipher, which is a method for encoding devised by Sir Francis Bacon in 1605. This form of encryption appears quite complex when you look at it, but its foundation is simple. It's essentially binary code. So in the Bacon cipher, each letter in the alphabet is replaced by a group of five letters in a combination of A and B. And in order to make this cipher work, the traditional way to write it is by using two different typefaces. So after preparing a false message with the same number of letters as all of the A's and B's that you need for your binary code, you are able to hide this message in plain sight. William also became familiar with cryptology through this project. He also had no previous experience, although both of them wound up making this a career. So in this example here, I have used two very similar but distinct typefaces to write a secret message encoded in this text. So it says, join us tonight on May 19th to explore the role of Elizabeth Friedman played in taking out rum runners during prohibition. So in this case, 
My cipher is based on two, like I said, very similar fonts, Gotham Medium and Gotham Bold. If you were to try to figure out what my secret uh, ciphered message would be, you would have to take all the letters in my first message and decide whether they are written in the medium version of the font or the bold font. Um, so in this case, there's technically two ways that this could be deciphered. You don't off the bat know whether I've picked the first letter to represent an A or a B. It is in fact a B, but like I said, that's not immediately apparent. I will talk about how cryptologists figure out what is the statistically most likely way to uh, decipher Bacon in a moment. But I've gone ahead and just gone through, J was a bold letter, so it's B. The next three are medium weight uh, letters, so they are all A's. Once you have this, you have to convert them into pairs of five because the pairs of five is how you will determine what each letter actually is. So using the standard Bacon cipher, it deciphers to the message, she took down Conexco. If that is not yet, um, if that means nothing to you right now, that's okay, I'll explain it. If it already means something to you, this lecture might not be for you because you might know as much about Elizabeth as I do. Um, all right, so let's move on from our cipher here and go back to sort of a broader, sort of a broader look at the field that she entered here. So I'm gonna be using five <laughs> words frequently throughout this talk. And unfortunately, they all sound pretty identical. So just very quickly, the definition for some of these things. Ciphers are an encryption system that affects individual letters or characters through algorithms or specific sequences of instructions. So in the case of the Baconian cipher, one letter becomes a series of five. Codes, on the other hand, are encryption systems that generally affect uh, individual words instead of specific letters. And so using arbitrary symbols, you are able to convert words into numbers, other words, symbols that are not connected to a specific language, and then a code book would be used to indicate which arbitrary relationship there is between the real word and the code. Cryptography is the art of creating codes and ciphers, and we'll not be discussing cryptography in great length because this isn't something that Elizabeth spent a lot of time with, but it is important to understand that it is the opposition of, of her field. Cryptology is the study of codes and ciphers, uh, both creating and solving them, and then cryptanalysis is the primary field that Elizabeth worked in. It's the practice of exposing coded and ciphered messages by breaking the code or cipher. It's often considered an art, uh, but it is based on both mathematical and scientific assumptions. So during World War I, and specifically in 1916, before the onset of World War I, um, the Freedmen's were, were becoming wary of the project they'd been working on. They weren't thrilled with the Shakespeare work. They were starting to become disillusioned. They believed that Elizabeth Wells Gallup's uh, assumptions about Sir Francis Bacon were not accurate, and they were eager to jump ship to a more respectable line of research. That opportunity came in 1917, in January. The US, uh, US intelligence discovered the Zimmerman telegram, which was a secret diplomatic communication issued from the German Foreign Office that proposed a military alliance between Germany and Mexico. If Mexico took them up on this alliance, they would win back most of the land that they'd lost in the Mexican-American War, as well as a number of other conflicts. Um, and the Zimmerman telegram was a rude awakening for U.S. intelligence, U.S. military operations. They realized that they didn't have enough code breakers. So Fabian immediately offered his services, and by services I mean his staff, to be code breakers for the U.S. government. 
For the first eight months of our involvement in World War I, the Riverbank team did all of the code breaking for the US government, and the Freedmen's were at the forefront of this team. And in May of 1917, they realized that they needed to diversify beyond just code breaking. And the Freedmen's began to offer a code breaking school to people who were a part of a number of different military organizations. And this cipher school really became an important part of what they did throughout the rest of their time as well. Before World War I, radio interference and interception was given very little thought. Radio was a relatively new technology, and there was very little concern over trying to encrypt your messages over radio. The Boer War was the first military conflict uh, right at the turn of the century to use wireless radio communications. And at the onset of World War I, radio equipment still had a very limited range and was subject to a lot of atmospheric interference. But it quickly became apparent that the German military was not going to stand for this limited radio communication. They put a lot of money and effort into improving radio communication, which meant that the Allied forces needed to do something to combat this. The US Army established the Signal Corps in 1860, and this is the group that would later become responsible for uh, our radio encryption and our radio interception. And this would later become the uh, military unit that William Friedman would serve in as well. And this here is a recruiting poster from 1918 and 1919 that was used by the Army Signal Corps. Fabian didn't like that the Freedmen's now had something that he did not, that they had this valuable skill and they didn't necessarily feel a real allegiance to him. And so he explicitly banned them from leaving Riverbank. Uh, he would intercept job offers, he spied on their communications, he read their mail, um, he intimidated both of them. Elizabeth wrote of even uh, you know, inappropriate advances that he made on her during this time period, all in an effort to intimidate both of them to stay in Riverbank. But Fabian finally allowed William to join the Army Signal Corps and the, the couple thought, this is great. You know, William will wind up sticking with the army after the war, we'll get out of here. Unfortunately, it would take them quite a bit of time to get out from underneath Fabian. But in December of 1920, uh, they did both get to start work uh, formally with the Army Signal Corps. Elizabeth didn't think that this was going to be her life's work. Uh, in 1922, she quit, she retired, she was going to have children. The, the couple did have two children. And she thought, well, this is it. And then everything changed completely. Uh, her retirement was incredibly short-lived because of prohibition. She continued to take sort of unofficial jobs throughout the early 1920s. And in 1926, Elizabeth became the special agent of the U.S. Treasury Department under the Coast Guard, recruited by Lieutenant Commander Charles Root to Codebreak for the Coast Guard. Her work is directly a response to Prohibition. At the onset of Prohibition in 1920, the Coast Guard had this new challenge. They were the nation's sole maritime law enforcement agency responsible for enforcing this new very, very specific federal law. They had to monitor illegal liquor traffic across all of our water borders, as well as the inland waterways. And by the mid-1920s, the rum runners all were already millionaires, and they were sinking a lot of that profit into getting bigger boats, faster boats, um, and also into hiring code writers who would encrypt messages as they sent shortwave radio transmissions. So this is a picture of Charles Root. Um, he was inspired to create this program, this, uh, this unit, I should say, by Mr. Robert J. Iverson, who uh, had, had essentially established this radio intercept site privately in New York. And he said, if we work together, if you take over this intercept site that I've already created, you can use this 
to intercept messages from run runners across the northeastern coasts. At first, that seemed like enough because run runner messages were quite simple. They were using only one or two ciphers. Uh, they were only changing their system about once or twice a year. And so the first few years, when Elizabeth was doing this unofficially, it was very piecemeal. And even through to the 19, uh, 1925 and 26, at the onset of her work, it was still a one-woman operation. Then in August of 1930, they realized that things had really ramped up, that she was getting to the point where she individually was doing thousands of these uh, in, uh, decryptions every single year. And so a group of federal agencies all got together and established a formal intelligence plan. They decided that moving forward, the Coast Guard had the responsibility for targets at sea, the Bureau of Customs for targets at point of entry, and the Bureau of Prohibition for targets located farther inland, with the Department of Commerce Radio Division making its expertise available as required and acting as the primary agency responsible for transmitters. Elizabeth Friedman decoded for all of these units. By the late 1920s, rum runners were using intricate systems in which large syndicates usually operated every step of the import system. The one thing they didn't do, though, is own their own ships. And this structure was incredibly profitable. The rum runners were willing to pay big to these code writers and radio operators that were operating between these large syndicates and the individual ship owners that were running their cargo. In 1930, one of these large rum running syndicates was paying the man in charge of their radio operations $10,000 a year. This is at a period when Elizabeth was making $4,000 a year and the average American was making about 2,500. This massive budget makes much more sense when placed into context of rum running earnings. In 1931, the estimated taxes owed to the US government by export syndicate consolidated exporters was over $119 million in 1931 dollars, which would be about $2 billion today. Um, and even though rum runners knew they were being intercepted, they were generally unfazed. And this, this holds true for law enforcement of prohibition in general. Rum runners and bootleggers were never concerned. They did not think that law enforcement was smart enough, well-equipped enough, or well-funded enough to stop them. And these messages are no exception. They also had so many informants. In one case, an informant in the custom houses in New Orleans was able to decipher, or was able to discover everything that was being deciphered, not only there in New Orleans, but also across Alabama and Mississippi. And the thing that he figured out was that they could only decipher a specific code if it was written in long sentence form. And so he told them, Shorten your messages, send a couple words at a time, and you can use that same cipher for months. This illustration from the Los Angeles Times highlights uh, how one of these operations worked. So these are the Canero brothers. Canero brothers are important to us here at the Mob Museum. We got pictures of them in the underground. We got pictures of them upstairs. We even got, well, I don't know about a picture, but we do have properties that they owned here on the second floor because these guys made all their money rum running and then they came here and opened a handful of casinos. While they were rum runners, they were one of these groups that were operating ships distinct from a large syndicate. So the large syndicate would have these huge mother ships that they would anchor about 30 to 50 miles offshore. And they would use these small ship and boat owners as contact boats to run liquor from the mother ship to shore. Tony the Hat Canero <laughs> um, operated out of Southern California along with his brothers. And he was sort of the typical middleman in this operation. He owned large ships as well as small, very fast transport boats, and he would use these in a series of sort of drop locations to get things from these giant motherships 
into the port cities of Southern California. Um, he's arrested and imprisoned numerous times for his involvement in rum running, but from the syndicate's perspective, that's fine. He's not actually their guy. In a lot of cases, even these very, very wealthy middlemen don't know who their boss is in the syndicates that they're working for. Um, and so even though he gets arrested time and time again, it's still very challenging for them to figure out who is running Conexco. One of the very first intercepted messages in December of 1925 later plays a role in a really important case. During the 1920s, a schooner named I'm Alone became infamous to the Coast Guard. It was equipped with a pair of 100 horsepower engines, which was a lot at the time, and a radio with a range of about 1,000 miles, which was definitely a lot and incredibly fishy. Uh, for six years, the I'm Alone escaped Coast Guard detection, and then in March of 1929, she was captured in the Gulf of Mexico, and the USCG cutters Walcott and Dexter engaged her in battle, and in this battle, one crew member died, and she sank. So you're thinking, well, they're rum runners. It's clear they're rum runners. That's fine. That's what happens in Coast Guard operations trying to enforce prohibition. But there's a catch. She's flying a Canadian flag. So this becomes an international scandal, an international incident, and it is immediately there is outcry from the Canadian government, for good reason, I get it. So the US government says, all right, we have to prove that we knew definitively that these were rum runners. How can we do that? Well, the reason they knew that it was a rum running vessel was because of Elizabeth Friedman. She had been decoding their messages since 1925, and by the time this happens in 1929, she has four years of proof that this is clearly a rum running vessel and that the vast majority of the crew are Americans, and the ship is owned by an American, regardless of whether it's flying that Canadian flag. In uh, international arbitration, Canada was awarded a public apology from the US for firing on the Canadian flag. And uh, as a part of these arbitration hearings, Elizabeth Friedman came and testified. And I have an audio clip of her describing what she had to do when she would go into these arbitration and, and also trial hearings. If we could start that audio. Dan Hogan, one of the supposed American owners of the rum running vessel, uh, was in prison on some other charges uh, already, and he was brought there in handcuffs in a very mean mood. And the captain of the Imalone, who was not guilty of anything, except that he went down with his ship, he just didn't drown and wasn't killed, but was the, uh, he, he was, um, you know, put through a lot of embarrassing uh, circumstances because um, uh, this was, uh, considered a, uh, a uh, rum-carrying vessel, and um, he was in a very mean mood. So I was told afterwards, I noticed that there, was, there was always a customs agent by my side all during that trial in the Justice Department, and uh, it went on for days. They had a very famous Canadian lawyer handling the case for the uh, uh, ship's owners of Canadian government, you know, and it was all very formal in a beautiful paneled room like this, no ordinary courtroom, I assure you. And um, um, the, the men all wore um, long tails, you know, Prince Alberts and, and uh, striped trousers and all that. Uh, and, uh, but I noticed that, that there was a, always one of the, the customs agents was sitting beside me. Somebody would always greet me as I came to the courtroom, and uh, one, one or another, not always the same person, is sitting by me. And afterwards, I was told that I was being guarded, that uh, both Dan Hogan, the, one of the American owners, and, um, and this former master of the I'm Alone uh, were, were 
there in a very, very... Of course, Dan Hogan was a prisoner. He couldn't have very well have gotten at me, but uh, the other man could. And he was a very, uh, very mean person because he couldn't get a job after that, you know. that. So, as she was saying, whenever she was a part of these trials, they had to give her specific enforcers, these federal enforcers who would watch over her. Um, and, and she was really putting herself at risk by testifying with her full face. She'd say her name. She was, you know, an official expert. And I, I'm going to stand from behind the podium for a moment only to illustrate something. She was a pretty petite woman, so she actually wasn't that much taller than me. Um, I mean, everyone is a bit taller than I am, but she wasn't that much taller. And she was going up against these hardened criminal men who were spending years out on rum running vessels. Uh, she was definitely putting herself at a bit of risk. Although prohibition enforcement does sort of get a justifiably bum rap, there were some successes. Uh, you know, this was a tough law to enforce. From the onset, public opinion was very divided. And it's very hard in anywhere, but particularly in the United States, to suddenly tell people that something that was legal is no longer legal. And so it was hard to enforce, but Elizabeth Friedman definitely, she carried her fair share of enforcement. Between 1927 and 1928, so just two, two years of um, prohibition, the U.S. Coast Guard was able to reduce the flow of illegal smuggling by 60% from 40 million gallons to 5 million gallons. Um, I'll be honest, it started creeping back up in the early 30s again because rum runners were still making money and they kept just getting more and more complex. But the U.S. Coast Guard did this because of the messages that Elizabeth and her team decoded. Many messages that she had to decode used more than one code or cipher, and she had to use mathematical and statistical models that she essentially taught herself in order to do this quickly and expediently. So for instance, in the English language, the most frequently used letter is E followed by T. So she would have a statistical sheet that would tell her look at how many times a certain code or a certain cipher comes up. We have to use that against the statistical model of the English language and figure out what these words are most likely to be. Uh, she also uh, used tables. She drew up uh, complex statistical tables to figure out how many two and three letter words there likely was in a specific uh, ciphered or coded message. And once she was able to draw up these frequency tables, she could make educated guesses about all of the smaller words that would then help her figure out the letters in larger words. Elizabeth got so good at all of this self-taught statistical and mathematical modeling that she went around the country to work not only on specific cases in cryptosystems, but also teaching other people how to do this. So one of her primary students is right here, Clarence Housel. He worked in the West Coast. Um, in 1928, she went and taught him, as well as a series of other agents, uh, Coast Guard, as well as other law enforcement agencies, how to use her models and how to use these frequency tables and these other statistical models to decode messages. And he actually wound up getting a lot of local press. He's not a name that's known the way the Friedman's names are, but uh, this is an article outlining the science triumphs that he and his team had in the hunt uh, for rum runners and other smugglers across the Pacific Northwest and down into California. In October of 1929, Elizabeth uh, traveled to Houston for a month, broke 24 different crypto systems, and solved 650 US customs messages there. And that's important because these Gulf Coast messages wind up being a big part of an incredibly important case, USA v. Burt Morrison. These constant code and cipher shifts 
had a, a large impact on Elizabeth's life. Uh, she once had to cancel a trip with William and the kids to go to Europe. Uh, she had to send a family member so that William wouldn't be in Europe with two small children alone. He said, you know, I still want to go to Europe and I still want to take the kids, but I think I might need a little bit of assistance. Um, and she just continued breaking thousands upon thousands of codes every year. Um, by 1930, according to Friedman, there was a different system being used on almost every single rum running vessel, which means that any given time, there are a couple of hundred different codes and ciphers that she has to have notes on and that the rest of her team has to have notes on in order to decode. Many of these were incredibly useful. Um, on the bottom of this slide here, you can see one that she deciphered on September 1930. It doesn't get clearer than this. Henry cannot take goods now. Proceed 50 miles east Britain Island and give to Lewis when he comes. And then a second message that came right after that explicitly laid out which brands of cases he was supposed to pass along. This is a typed example of one of her deciphered messages, and she would have to create these. Uh, anytime that she needed to testify, she would have to type out these explanations because as an expert witness, people wanted to trip her up. People wanted to say, there's no way that you can do this. This isn't real. It's a pseudoscience. It's just an art. It's just some woman sitting in an office making things up. And so she would have to type out everything. It's kind of like, you know, high school algebra, show your work. Of course, she could just do it. She could have just done it. But no, they make her show her work each time. Other messages, though, had little bearing on enforcement. Elizabeth loved these types of messages, though, because she said that it really did keep her grounded and entertained in what could be very challenging work. Um, and in fact, Andrew was a man who worked on uh, one of the Gulf Coast boats for quite a while, and she said that Andrew caused uh, quite a lot of commotion on these boats. He was a great source of amusement for her. Not only did he once lose his glass eye, but another time uh, there was a message where he requested that his wife row out to meet him and please bring a pair of size 15 shoes. So poor Andrew, um, in Elizabeth's own words, I often pondered, had Andrew been roughhousing and in this scuffle lost his glass eye or a shoe overboard? <laughs> and I, I mean, in doing research on her, I also get great joy out of Andrew. I mean, how can you not? Um, so Elizabeth worked almost entirely by herself in her DC office until 1930. She was training these disciples around the country, but in her own office, she had one part-time female clerk, and that was it. In November of that year, in November of 1930, citing the I'm Alone case as a good example of why she needed more help, she and her boss, Lieutenant Commander Gorman, were able to talk the Coast Guard into creating a full cryptanalytic unit. And so this provided them greater freedom as well as authority in intervening very quickly in smuggling operations, she headed a team of six. And uh, she was very excited. She got to do all of the hiring decisions on her own. And she talks at length about how excited she was that she was going to sort of build up her team. She painstakingly looked through all of the federal exams to make sure that she was picking people with the right temperament. Her initial team, was primarily three young men. There were no women who had um, passed the appropriate tests to qualify for this position. But she did continue to try to elevate both young men and young women throughout her time. In 1931, she also trained T-men uh, to use new radio direction finders that the IRS were working with. And they were able to work in tandem with Coast Guard radio detection trucks uh, to track the pirate radio stations that were not only out, out on sea, but also on land. So, Conexco. I mentioned it earlier. I told you she took them down, and then I said nothing else for 40 minutes. Um, Conexco is the common nickname for Consolidated Exporters Corporation of Vancouver. 
Canada, we have Canada to thank for m such a huge amount of alcohol that made it into the United States during Prohibition. Even alcohol that wasn't made in Canada, we still have Canada to thank for getting it across our borders. In 1925, two of the major syndicates of rum runners were operating out of Vancouver, limited and consolidated exporters. Hobbs, Hobbs family of limited of Vancouver sold off their assets to Conexco and Conexco became the de facto leader of Canadian exports. They worked directly with the mob, which I'll talk a bit about in a moment. And both of these operations, but specifically Conexco as they continued to grow, took these incredibly circuitous routes in their rum running trade. So at first, Traffic could come directly from, from Canada into the United States. But beginning in 1930, the United States government, I, I was going to say talked the Canadian government, but begged, begged the Canadian government to pass a law that would outlaw import into the United States. And Canada agreed to do this. And so at that point, these Canadian operators said, well, we're not going to close up shop. We're just going to start using additional ports. So what they would do is, if they wanted to get something from Vancouver to LA, they might go to Tahiti first, or they might hang out in Belize, or they might take the Panama Canal, go, uh, go to Europe, come back, do a whole thing. They had so many different ways to get around this. And um, under Canadian law, they had to warehouse, they had to have these, uh, these sort of waiting periods in warehouses anytime they were transporting in and out of Canada. So there were huge shipments of what was essentially Canadian liquor sitting in ports all across the world waiting to come back into the United States. What this means is that you need constant radio communication to figure out where all of these things are going, who's taking them, how many ships you need. and. In this audio clip, another audio clip from Friedman, she talks about how these codes were operating at this point. I was told by uh, the RCMP that uh, a, um, a retired uh, British naval captain was advising the, the rum runners on the west coast of uh, what uh, was really making their secret systems of communication for them. Well, that's but what the, I was... the the uh, consolidated exporters, rum running uh, vessels, operated uh, on a code system clear around the United States, starting from Vancouver, British Columbia, and all the way down through the Panama Canal and way up to Nova Scotia, where they loaded again. There, you see, they loaded at either end and dispensed their their smuggled goods. Uh, all the way along as the ships went around and they had what would be equivalent to a high level government code. So as she says, these codes are as advanced as can be. I mean, these are the same quality of codes that are essentially later used in World War II. These are high level, well thought out, constantly evolving codes. And a lot of this is because these guys in Canada not only don't want you to know who they are, they also don't want you to know who they're working with in the States. It wouldn't be the Mob Museum if I didn't bring up some of these guys. In Minneapolis, Kid Can Blumenfeld was the rum running kingpin, a very powerful Minneapolis mobster, and very highly publicized that he's connected to Conexco in the case I'll talk about in a moment, USA v. Albert Morrison. In this same trial, connections to Al Capone came out. I mean, duh. Al Capone, uh, running in Chicago, worked extensively with Conexco. And this is to get alcohol down through the Great Lakes, as well as through multiple other circuitous channels. Uh, in New York, at the beginning of Prohibition, Big Bill Dwyer was the sort of main go-to guy for Conexco. He had been born in Hell's Kitchen in the 1880s, and he was not going to go into organized crime. Like, this, that wasn't his goal. 
he became a stevedore and he was approached at the onset of prohibition to create a smuggling operation using his connections to other stevedores and longshoremen. And uh, through these connections, he began confiscating liquor. Um, he, or, uh, he began hijacking confiscated liquor, sorry about that. And he became sort of the initial man on the ground for Conexco in New York. But it's New York, they needed more than one guy. So, uh, Big Bill Dwyer begins working with Oni Madden uh, in 1923. And in 1925, when Dwyer uh, goes to prison, Oni Madden becomes sort of the head of the Conexco New York connection. He also worked very closely with Dutch Schultz, um, who was a, uh, an important part of the overland uh, management of, of alcohol shipments. He uh, used his family's trucking company to run alcohol throughout Prohibition. Um, and he also partnered with Dwyer and Madden on a number of um, other bootlegging and, and uh, race wire operations. Frank Costello also gets in on it. Um, he becomes connected to uh, Dwyer in the late 1920s and brings on board both Luciano and Meyer Lansky. So my point in bringing this up I know we're here at the Mob Museum and I literally only have one slide with the guys that we usually talk about, but there is a reason. The reality when we get to rum running, these are the guys running things in the States, but they need other connections. I am not diminishing the amazing operations that they got together in the States. Clearly these men were very intelligent, highly organized, running these huge, huge syndicates. But they needed connections internationally to make these things run. And Conexco was one of those operations. The Conexco connection is exposed in 1931. Federal agents raid the New York headquarters of Conexco. They had a New, York, a New Orleans arm. And they initially arrest nine people, including um, three agents of Al Capone, Nathan Goldberg, uh, Al Hartman, and Harry Doe, the radio operator for New Orleans, Charles Andrews, as well as two Canadian agents, Burt Morrison and J.D. O'Neill. They also issue warrants for another 100 people, which included other Chicago area mobsters, other New Orleans and Gulf Coast mobsters, New York, Minneapolis mobsters. They got they got a lot of people here. One of the first people arrested was Burt Morrison and he becomes the namesake of this case. So here are some of the uh, news coverage regarding this. And what I think is interesting about these articles is they say so much without actually implicating or naming any specific person. And the reason that that is to me very important is that all of these people are connected. Just because Al Capone and Burt Morrison are the only two whose specific names are coming up in these articles doesn't mean that they're not all interconnected. Rum running was not these specific syndicates running independently of each other. And USA v. Albert Morrison is a good example of how these relationships take down mobsters and take down um, other, you know, other individuals a part of rum running during Prohibition. So in 1933, Elizabeth travels to New Orleans to testify as an expert witness against Burt Morrison and 22 co-defendants. On her first day at trial, seven defense attorneys, including Al Capone's lawyer, Edwin Grace, stand up immediately object to her testimony and her appearance in and of itself. They say, this is not scientific. There's no way she knows what she's talking about. These messages could mean anything. And she spends hours and hours and hours on the stand justifying how she is able to decode these messages, why she knows definitively, objectively what these messages say. And this was an incredibly important case. 
Federal prosecutors had spent half a million dollars in a two-year investigation building this case, so a lot rode on her testimony and her ability to prove that they knew what they were talking about and that they had solid, objective evidence behind them. While in court, she uh, asked for a blackboard and demonstrated how she converted these codes into plain language using a blackboard. Um, in the example uh, of, in one example, she showed how she knew that a specific liquor brand was Old Colonel, and the way she did that was through the multiple duplication of O's and L's, which don't tend to be letters that, that uh, fall so closely together so frequently. And she proceeded systematically through message after message, just saying very plainly, very matter-of-factly, how she deciphered each individual step along the way. And it wasn't just prohibition offenses that brought her toe-to-toe -to -toe with these very violent underworld figures. In 1933, she also helped to bust an opium smuggling ring that was operated by the Ezra brothers out of Shanghai. They had created an opium combine, and uh, the Ezra brothers actually worked directly, again, with Charles Luciano, Frank Costello, and Meyer Lansky. Um, fun fact, those guys were bringing opium into New York, and one of the ways they were doing it was this Shanghai Opium Combine. Um, the brothers were arrested in May of 1933, and after they were arrested and the, the AP and Universal uh, Press Service found out about the case, they, they went to Elizabeth and they asked, you know, tell us how you knew, how, how are you doing this time and time again? And I love that in her interview she said, I can't tell you how to do it. In the first place, it'd take a week or two to explain it. And in the second place, we have to keep our ideas secret so that we don't give other smugglers any new ideas. Friedman shared a lot of thoughts on prohibition um, and the 1920s in general in later interviews. Uh, she at one point said uh, that, you know, never had the criminals found such a gushing well of profits and never had the anti-criminal forces encountered such universal tidal waves of law breaking. And she was very defensive of the efforts of the federal government. You know, um, I think that this quote right here is a really good example of how rightfully defensive she was of the work that she and the rest of the Coast Guard and the rest of federal agents that she worked with undertook. Few persons in the present day, and this is from, a, uh, this is from an interview in the 1970s, few persons in the present day realize anything of the enormity of the situation in the United States while the Volstead Act was in effect. Government law enforcement agencies had no more taste for it than the public who loved their drink. But government officials, who with minor exceptions were honest at least, had no choice but to pursue the rigid, torturous paths of attempting to defeat the operations of these criminal gangs. And that's exactly what she did. She continued her work busting smugglers, whether it was uh, liquor, drugs, or other illegal goods, not only throughout Prohibition, but into the 19, early 1940s. And then at the onset of World War II, she transitioned to working in counterintelligence against the Nazis. During the war, her team uh, decoded 4,000 messages, and her work in counterintelligence was so secretive that in a lot of ways people sort of forgot what she, she was working on and what she was doing. And for decades, a lot of her work was overshadowed by her husband. In the same time period, he and his team were uh, breaking uh, the Purple Code out of Japan, which was much more highly publicized, um, primarily because even though it was still certainly a counterintelligence operation, it was something that they could be a little more public about. And the United States government actively uh, participated in, in uh, broadcasting the, the fame of, of William Friedman's team. After World War II, Elizabeth became a consultant to the International Monetary Fund, and she began actually working in uh, communication security systems, uh, really, really doubling down on the mathematical and statistical work that she learned in cryptology. In 1957, after uh, both of the Friedmans retired, they returned to their work with Shakespeare. 
Um, and after, uh, after thinking about it truly for decades off and on, they spent their whole adult lives thinking about this quandary and trying to disprove Elizabeth Wells Gallup, the woman who first taught them their chosen profession. Um, and their work essentially proving that there was no way that, that you know, even if Sir Francis Bacon did write Shakespeare, you couldn't tell because of Baconian ciphers, that wasn't giving it away. Um, the ambiguity of font styles from the time period they were able to systematically prove, and they won awards from the Folger Shakespeare Library as well as the American Shakespeare Theater, Theater and Academy for really helping to break down this, this conspiracy theory, if you will. Elizabeth passed away um, at the age of 88 in New Jersey in 1980. Um, William had passed away about a decade earlier in uh, late 1969. And Elizabeth's legacy really does reach far beyond the Prohibition era. But the work that she did building up proficiency for code breaking in the United States during Prohibition really set the stage for what the United States would go on to do in intelligence and counterintelligence, specifically and obviously very importantly in World War II, but also throughout the intervening decades. So that is all I have for you tonight. I thank you so much for joining me, and uh, I'm glad I got to talk to, talk to you about Elizabeth Friedman today. Is this on? Claire, thank you. If anyone has any questions for Claire, you can come right up to this mic here, and I'm sure she can answer any questions. We'll see if I can answer them. <laughs> Anyone? Or you can shout them out too, that's okay. Here you go. How long did it take for anybody to recognize what she had done and who came across this information initially to be able to present it? So um, that's an excellent question. The you know, I maybe do a little bit of disservice by saying that her, her legacy had been forgotten because there were people in the intelligence field keeping her legacy alive. Um, the Coast Guard certainly acknowledges her. They've named a couple of different uh, cutters and, and other ships for her over the years. ATF also has a wonderful collection of, of her papers and materials, and specifically the George Marshall Foundation has the majority of both of the Freedmen's papers, so I was able to utilize a lot of their resources to do my research. Um, I know that that's the primary repository that both of the books that were written in 2017 used as well. The, the cryptological field remembered who she was, but as is so often the case, the rest of us just sort of forgot. You know, there's so many of these unsung heroes, men and women, that we just forget about. Any other questions? All right, well, Claire, thank you so much. Oh, one more. Yes, um, so they were, and actually I want to make sure I say the right, for the ones that I played, I want to say the right thing. Um, there were a series of interviews and oral histories conducted with her in the 1970s. Um, the two recordings that I played were conducted at the George uh, Marshall Foundation in Virginia, and you can actually listen to that audio online. Um, they, they don't have their whole collection digitized, but if you just Google George C. Marshall Foundation, um, you can listen actually to the full things, and you can also get the transcripts. They are, I, they're wonderful. She's, I, she sounds, she sounds so, I, like you can just feel that she remembers everything that she did, which is remarkable 50 years later to have such recall for uh, the things that she'd done. And I do definitely recommend, uh, for any of you who are interested in this topic, um, the two books that I mentioned, The Woman Who Smashed Codes, um, and, um, oh my gosh, uh, I'm blanking on the title of the other, which I feel terrible about. It's written here in my notes that are now out of order. 
Um, but, but two books on her did come out in 2017, and I definitely recommend those. We also have some materials written about her um, on our website. We have a blog written my, by my colleague, Jeff Burbank, as well as um, some other materials that myself and other team members have written. And then, yeah, if you're interested, definitely check out those oral histories. It's, it's worthwhile to hear her talk. You do need to set aside quite a bit of time because there's hours and hours of audio footage. All right, Claire, thank you. Uh, she is, as you can tell, extremely knowledgeable, um, <laughs> such an informative presentation, um, so well done, and it is quite the honor to work with her. So thank you, Claire, and thank you to everyone who uh, joined us in person and online. We appreciate you joining us tonight. Have a good night. Thank you.